Fasten your seatbelts. You're about to take off on one of the most suspenseful journeys television news has ever produced. I'm Steve Croft, and this is a CBS classic, The Plane That Fell From the Sky. On April 4th, 1979, a Boeing 727 fell 33,000 feet, six and a half miles, in 44 seconds. The 89 people on board came within two seconds of crashing. Most of them thought they would die. For those of the 89 who still fly, every landing they now make is a miracle. Tonight, we're going to find out what happened during one of the most extraordinary flights in the history of commercial aviation. In a moment, we'll take you back to April 4th, 1979, and put you inside the plane that fell from the sky. disasters are nothing new, but when TWA Flight 841 happened, television found a new way of bringing that kind of story to life and showing what happens to those who survive. The CBS classic broke new ground by daring to blend the hard facts of journalism with the theatrics of Hollywood. It sparked controversy, but earned near record ratings in the process. The plane that fell from the sky was first shown on July 14, 1983, at a time when the news was filled with reports about air crashes, near misses, and disasters in the sky. The saga of TWA Flight 841 would force viewers to see those kinds of stories as never before. Correspondent Bill Curtis begins the story on firm ground, but soon passengers, crew, and television viewers would find themselves in the middle of an extraordinary real-life drama. This is where it started, JFK Airport, New York, where TWA 841 originated on a clear spring evening in 1979. Tonight you will see a recreation of that flight, which we filmed in a studio at an airport and in a cockpit simulator. We flew the three-man flight crew and 39 of the 82 passengers to these locations so they could show us what happened when their 14-year-old 727 fell out of the sky. It is not necessarily the version of the National Transportation Safety Board or the Federal Aviation Administration or the Boeing Company. This is what the flight crew members and the passengers have told us. Except for the flight attendants who work for another airline, all the people you will see in this recreation were on TWA 841 that night. And all the words you will hear are there. The passengers boarding Flight 841 from New York to Minneapolis were a typical mix of people traveling for business and pleasure, of novice and experienced flyers. The Andrettas were returning from a funeral in Italy, Deborah Price from an archaeological conference in London, the Rushers and Gaultiers from a vacation in Spain. Oh, just fine. A little later. sorry. Yes, we are. Holly Wicker, an adoption escort, was traveling with orphan children from Calcutta. Seeing the children through the long, strange flight to their new homes in Minnesota, Holly and Cheryl Fisher had just taken charge of the children in New York. Excuse me, you're going to need to buckle her in. The children were tired in that they had been in the air for a long time, uh, but they knew they were going to their new moms and dads at that point, and so they were excited. I was expecting a larger plane. Up close, that particular plane looked uh, kind of old and beat up. It looked like... A real Model T 727. Salty, 20-year-old airplane. Certainly not a new piece of equipment. There was plenty of time to settle in. Dr. Fair thought about the only copies of his research notes for a speech he was to give the next morning. Fred Rusher noted that the flight number, 841, was the same as the address of the house he was born in. Shell and Louise Roberts talked about the baby they expected in a few months. Patricia Moss Morgan's horoscope that day advised against travel. Roger Peterson was a little bit nervous. I always remember thinking, when I get on a plane, you know, is anything going to happen? We hadn't flown since we got married. I loved flying. In fact, when I was very young, I thought maybe I'd even be a stewardess. I think I probably was the last 
person to board. I thought I missed the point. I just have been a person that has tried to let my head rule my fears, and so I've always known that flying is by far the safest way to travel. For the crew, 841 was just one more leg on a flight package which began the day before in Los Angeles and took them to Phoenix, Albuquerque, Amarillo, Wichita, Kansas City, Chicago, Columbus, and Philadelphia. They had rested a while at Kennedy Airport and picked up this 727 for the night flight to Minneapolis. The plane that we picked up was dirty, filthy, and it was going to be night, so I cleaned up the cockpit as best I can. We were on the second day of the trip at this point, so we know each other pretty well by this time. I've flown with Scott a few times before, and I've never seen Gary before. Scott was a nice guy, first rate from where I was at. Hoot was the first one to say, I've been on the plane for just a few months. Uh, if you see me doing anything wrong, let me know. A little bit because this is my first trip back on this airplane for a long time. So uh, just keep an eye on me. Uh, Kennedy Ground Control, this is uh, Peter DH-841. Now, we notice an awful lot of lights out here ahead of us. Uh, we just wondered uh, where we are in line uh, for uh, takeoff. Now, uh, number 27, all right. We were about two and a half hours late before we actually departed Kennedy. Our conversations had a lot to do with, Lord, here we are, and it's a long time before we can get off. We're moving up very slowly, all kinds of little beacon lights out there. If we could have your attention in the forward and mid-cabin, we'd like to acquaint you with some of the safety features of the Boeing 727. Your seat's equipped with a metal-to-metal -metal seat belt. And the flight attendants the gave their demonstration. I didn't pay close attention at all because I'd been through it once already that day and a couple times earlier that week. We thank you for your attention and hope you have a pleasant flight. I thought it would be interesting to write to my son about the takeoff. We look out and all we can see are little blue lights in the middle of complete blackness. Beautiful takeoff. Power on those engines is the best part of the whole flight. Well, here we go. We are climbing, and we're going up so high. We're still climbing. My ears are popping, and I have to keep swallowing, but I am okay. Dad and I do wish you could be with us. The stewardesses are now preparing hot trays of food for everyone. But frankly, I think I'll turn down the food. I'm going to rest for now, and I'll let you know how the landing takes place. The older children were pretty hungry by then, and we were sort of waiting to see which American foods they were going to accept and which they were going to reject. We climbed to 35,000 feet, and uh, we were in the clear. Sure is smooth to have a wind that strong. At that altitude, we were experiencing a considerably heavy headwind. I did a ground speed okay. check. It looks like we've got about 100 to 110 knot loss here at the 35. Hey, Gary, why don't you tell me when we're lining up for 39 and we'll go on up? When it came time, I said, you know, it's time to roll. We can go up to 39. Sir, anytime you want. All right, Roger, third. Uh, DWA is 841. It's cleared to 590390. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. We've been cruising at uh, 35,000 feet and experiencing headwinds of about... He did tell us he was going up to 39,000 feet. And, uh, I got up and left my seat and went to the uh, bathroom. We'll be climbing up there shortly. Thank you. My husband, being a smoker, decided that he was going to go back of the plane and smoke. I proceeded to spread my cosmetics on the counter and then started combing my hair. I sat in the back of the plane, lit a cigarette. And I think, how smooth this flight is. It's like sitting in my living room. It was a very clear night outside, pretty close to a full moon. Scott was doing a ground speed check, and Gary was just making final adjustments on the power. The first thing I noticed was a uh, very slight vibration. You can feel it in the balls of your feet, you know, just a high frequency vibration in, in the airplane. All of a sudden, there was sort of a shutter where the whole plane shook. What is that? Mom, what's happening? I don't know. The jacket's down, Mom! Don't worry, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. The nose went down. I couldn't control the roll right. Get him up. I look towards Get Hoot. him up. Get him up. Get him up. He's hollering, get him up. Get him up. Only no one's responding yet. 
and he was telling me to pull the spoiler handle. He let go of the wheel with his hand and reached over and pulled him up himself. That doesn't even slow the plane down. That doesn't even start to slow the plane down. The airplane was flying itself. It was doing its own thing. And then we just tailed off into this thing and just went into a big spiral. It felt just as if a giant hand were propelling us at an extreme uh, rate of acceleration. One of the stewardesses was going flying by, so I grabbed her. The screaming of these engines were just horrifying. The sound was like this rushing, screaming sound, like those old movies when a plane is hit. We held on for dear life. Everything did go into slow motion. Push back into the seat, deeper and deeper and deeper into the seat. You thought that you were going to run out of cushion. My attention at that point was totally focused on a five-pound baby on my lap who was turning blue. All I could think was that I had to give her mouth to mouth. And I just figured that if anybody had a chance, it would be in the back. There'd be nothing left of us in the front. All I knew was I have to get out of there, as though getting out of the bathroom was going to make everything OK. I found myself yelling at the top of my voice, instructions to the pilot. I was able to move my hand up and touch my face, and it felt like stone. Maybe this is the way you feel when you're dead. I felt like something was coming down on top of me, like the old horror movies. This big cement block is coming down on the heroine. It's going to crush her to death. Our plane is descending at a rate of 76,000 feet a minute. Scott was on the, on the control wheel with me. Tried going forward, backward, and reversing the controls, ran the spoiler handle up and down at least a couple of times. Nothing was effective at all. It'd be like uh, sitting in your car on a grease rack or something where nothing's hooked up. Yeah, I just knew that uh, what we were doing wasn't regaining control of the aircraft. And I literally say to myself, my God, it's all over. I wonder what it's going to feel like to hit. I think we just accepted the fact that everybody was going to die. So I asked uh, the Lord if he wouldn't save all the passengers in the plane, perform one uh, miracle. All human beings have an end. This is mine, and I found myself ready for it. I won't feel any pain. It'll just be lights going out. I knew I was going to die alone. I said, I love you, Lord. Please make it fast. I shut my eyes and expected to hit the ground. The first thing that came into mind was the landing gear. I held my hand out, and Cap saw it, and he said, yeah, gear down. I put the gear down. Suddenly, the plane is reacting. And the G-forces on the plane are increasing so fast. Oh, God, no, I'm going black, going black in the middle of an emergency. Come on, baby, pull it out. Come on, baby, pull it out. Pull this sucker out! When we came out of the fall, it felt somewhat like a roller coaster ride coming off the bottom of the largest hill. We came out of the clouds 50 degrees nose up. Next thing I recall is coming back out of semi grayness. Easy, five degree. Bring it down just a little bit. Easy. We're in a 45 degree left bank turn. I couldn't read the instruments because they were shaking so bad. But Gary was telling me air speeds, attitudes, and everything. Don't go negative. Don't go negative. Bring it down. That's it. Look at This is Merrill. Had fallen out of the restroom, and she appeared to be unconscious. And I had no idea where I was or what had happened. I was just in a fog. She appeared to be in a state of shock. She was staring straight ahead. I don't think she was seeing anything. Floyd Carlson, he had a screwdriver sitting on the arm of his chair, and we went through that whole dive and that thing, and that drink never spilled or nothing. I started shaking all over Jane. Couldn't control the shaking. I was crying the whole time, hysterically. I turned to the woman and said, we may have to do something, and I'd like to be able to hear what it is. She shut up like a faucet. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure it's been very apparent to everybody that we've had a slight problem. All right, we're going to be pretty busy up here for the next few minutes, and we'll get back to you as uh, 
quickly as we can. Almost immediately was we've when Gary said, well, we've lost the system A hydraulics. Down. Pressure's down. Okay, I'm going to fly the airplane. And Captain Gibson said to us, okay, I'll fly the airplane and you guys deal with the emergencies. The air traffic controller had already said something, and so I told him to stand by. We'd be with him in a minute. We had a problem. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're going to have to... Scott and I are screaming. If system A, turn the emergency procedures. The, the and fluid is zero. The fluid is zero. It's okay, all the way down. System A, both pumps are going to depressurize. So I came back and sat next to her. I said to him, Art, where in the world have you been? If we go down, we should go down together. Go back there to have a smoke. I bet if you asked any person in that plane, if, if they had a parachute where they have jumped, everybody would have said yes. We talked about where we were going to go to land the airplane. You guys take care of the checklist. We finally decided we were going to go to Detroit because that was a, a TWA facility. Detroit sounds fine to me. He was having a great deal of difficulty keeping it level. And I reached over and the three of us held hands and he said the our father. I will be done. Honor I have a feeling that uh, there's an awful lot of prayers in that plane. There were a lot of people who were very silent, who were living through this, very much by themselves. Everybody seemed to be making their own piece of that. Crank nose gear down. We had three red lights, Until which red means gear the gear is unsafe. On. It's not locked. Boy, but when we crank the nose gear down, Four all the buffeting goes away. Five turns. Green light. Green light. Okay, all Gary, right. Get the flight, get one I of the told Gary up here. to brief the flight and, attendants. Uh, prepare him for the worst. All of a sudden, we heard the bell ring, and then all the attendants rushed into the galley and pulled a curtain. Listen, we've got to get the cabin ready for emergency landing. And I was trying to listen. They were saying to the galley, and I, I couldn't hear, but... Eight minutes to do it. You understand? Okay, let's go. Let's get they came out, and they were very business-like, very stern-faced. And it will be with me for the rest of my life. The very first two words he said were, upon impact. The stewardess came along, and she walked on the armrest, and she threw everything down. The coats they threw down, you would use that as cushioning, plus the pillows and the blanket. Take your shoes off, put them in the seatbelt pockets in front of you. They're a lot better off than we are. They have something to do. And we had nothing to do but to sit there and do what we were told. Check the security of your seatbelt. I was looking around at the other passengers. I saw a couple hugging each other and crying. We requested to, to fly down the runway at 75 to 100 feet in the air. We wanted somebody out there to look at the airplane to let us know what the bottom side looked like. The tower operator put a beam on us, and they were able to determine that the gear was down. OK, to the A41, runway three left, cleared to land. One could see it looked like the, uh, the second armored division had arrived. And I could see the ambulances and the fire trucks out there waiting, and I knew what they were waiting for. Hey. There right. wasn't a whole okay, lot of control listen. left. We're going and crash in. And we've decided that the first approach is the last approach. Coming through 200 feet. Emergency position now! Three of us were all praying together, and we were holding hands. Uh, you know, I guess there were a lot of prayers sent, uh, sent skyward at that point in, in many ways and in many tongues. I knew that we were going to crash, and I was going to see something, a uh, bright light, or keeping her or something. The runway looks farther away than it's ever looked in its life. Everybody's just about holding their breath. We're approaching the runway. 40 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet. It's flying it all right. So we shot the approach right at about 200 knots. We seemed to touch on one gear. And then that first wheel hit the ground. And I thought, thank God, he's even able to hold it on one gear. All three are reversing. The nose gear touches, and it's all right. And we're going down the runway, and we have no brakes. And I remember Poop just saying, "Stop, you son of a bitch, stop." See, everybody was just whistling and shouting and applauding. There's a tremendous sigh of relief. Praise the Lord. They were home. As we walked out of the airplane, 
the stewardess that I grabbed a hold of, I gave her a hug as we left. The door of the front cabin was Thank ajar. Thank you for bringing us in. That was a remarkable job. Thank you, sir. The two members of the crew were sitting and staring straight ahead, almost as if they were in shock. I felt very much like kissing the earth. Uh, I was glad to get on terra firma. It was unbelievable that here it is. But we're just happy to be get our feet back on the ground again. The minute I got off that plane and stepped under the first step, I knew we were all right. It appeared to me as if a bomb had exploded underneath the plane. There was kind of a hole. I can't believe that landing gear wire didn't collapse. We never imagined that it was possible to get the thing on the ground in one piece. On this night, they were heroes. But it would be only a matter of days before the federal investigators' questions would begin to cast doubt on the crew's story. In a moment, we'll return with a look at that investigation. There was terror in the air last night for eight... Within 24 hours, millions would know about the dive of Flight 841. Suddenly, the plane began vibrating and then did a complete rollover. It dived 29,000 feet, more than five miles, before the pilot regained control. Federal aviation officials today are seeking the reason for that bizarre accident. Eight days after the dive, Les Kempshire, the chief investigator of this case for the federal government's National Transportation Safety Board, called the crew to an open deposition in Inglewood, California. All the interested parties were there. ALPA, the pilot's union. TWA, the carrier. Boeing, the manufacturer of the 727. The Federal Aviation Administration. When the airplane, and the press. When the airplane rolled the first time, it, the nose dropped considerably. So when it rolled a second time, the nose dropped considerably more. And then it was the pilot's first and only chance to tell their story before an official body. But instead of probing the pilot's version of what happened, the questioning focused on an unexpected issue, the cockpit voice recorder. The cockpit voice recorder indicates an erasure. Did you erase the recorder? Not to my knowledge. Did anyone erase the... I didn't see anybody erase it. But it was erased, and that made the investigators suspicious. Was the crew trying to hide something? Would you, would you agree with me, sir, that, that this investigation is handicapped by the absence of a cockpit voice recorder? Nobody wishes more than I do that we had this thing, because what it would have done, it would have made, it would have made the two crew members that work with me, it would have made them look really good, because they did a real professional job. And I wish that we had this information also. Well, sir, would you at least agree with me that whatever information was on that cockpit voice recorder uh, we, this investigative body, will never know. During the erasure was a turning set, point. Soon after this meeting, uh, Chief uh, Investigator Kempshire told Aviation Consumer Magazine, uh, I assume they're hiding something. I just can't prove it. I'm satisfied there was nothing wrong with the airplane. The NTSB said he was misquoted, but the pilots were convinced he had made up his mind against them. Did Hood Gibson press this button and erase the tape recorder? It was never determined, but the pilots don't think it should matter. Throughout the airline industry, they were routinely erasing the tape after every flight. They believed that it was made for fatal crashes only. 841 didn't crash. And why so much made of a tape recording, they asked, that erases itself every 30 minutes and wouldn't have included the dive anyway because it took 45 minutes to land at Detroit. Still, the investigators couldn't help wondering, was there something incriminating on tape? An assumption that infuriates co-pilot Scott Kennedy. You find out we certainly didn't have time to sit here and work up some kind of a lie. We were we just had our hands full of a very sick airplane at night. Investigators inspected that sick plane in Detroit the day after. The underside was torn. The landing gear was hanging loose. But the most obvious damage was a gaping hole in the right wing. The leading edge slat number seven was missing and the inside part that makes it extend and retract, called the actuator, was gone. The National Transportation Safety Board asked Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, to conduct tests. Once again, the pilots take exception. To well, them, kind of Boeing is not exactly a disinterested party. To have Boeing conduct your investigation for you as to what went wrong with the airplanes, like uh, putting Dracula in charge of the booking, is it a common practice to have the plane's manufacturer do the tests on the plane as happened in 841? Yes, it is. And uh, the, um, with, most of the time, now, and the reason for that is the, 
depth of technical knowledge of... Boeing declined an interview, so we asked C.O. Miller, former director of the National Transportation Safety Board's Bureau of Aviation Safety, about the policy of having a manufacturer to its own plane. Wouldn't one expect them to protect the airplane? Well, again, uh, to some degree, I'm sure. What did Boeing find? They found evidence of misalignment and metal fatigue here in the number seven slat. But the chances that it somehow extended on its own at 39,000 feet because of a crack in the actuator, the part that pushes it in and out right here, were impossible. They wrote the NTSB that Boeing has no record of any such fracture occurring in the 16-year, 36 million flight hour service history of the 727 East. Are you satisfied with the Boeing contention that it's impossible for the actuator to have extended independently because it had never happened before? Absolutely not. That is the, the most uh, uh, violent uh, affront on logic of safety engineering I've ever seen. But uh, let, let's get back to basic physics. You've got something out there which is doing a job. It's got loads on it and everything. You come out after the accident, you find it broken. And, and, uh, and to coldly, and I use that word advisedly, coldly suggest that this can't happen. Uh, I, I would uh, take issue with that. I don't care who says it. Boeing placed the blame here, in the cockpit. They suggested that pilots Gibson, Kennedy, and Banks tried to increase the plane's airspeed by using an unauthorized procedure. At the time, there was shop talk among pilots that airspeed could be increased by extending the flaps slightly. So Boeing theorized that the pilots tried to extend the flaps in mid-flight by pressing two buttons here and one at the rear of the cockpit. If that is what the crew did, the procedure proved disastrous. The plane rolled to the right, turning over once. And during the second roll, it went into a nose-down spiral heading straight for the ground falling 33,000 feet in less than a minute. The maneuver, which they claim caused the dive, is labeled the Boeing scenario. Had you ever heard of that scenario or that kind of practice before? No, I never had. In fact, the first time I heard of that was about three weeks after the incident when, when the National Transportation Safety Board began to uh, leak that information out to aviation publications. And I, I didn't even know what they were talking about. Nobody's going to go up there, and, and not with 80-some passengers, they're not going to go up there and, and uh, screw around. What would, what would you have done if Hoot had done the maneuver, the scenario? I would have probably turned him in at the earliest opportunity, as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. Have no problem with that one. The Boeing scenario was a theory only, and both TWA and the pilots' union demanded it be withdrawn from the report because it went beyond what Boeing was instructed to do, conduct physical tests. Boeing complied and took it out of the report in November of 1979. But the NTSB investigators would not forget it. A year and a half later, when they met here to issue their final report, the Boeing scenario was adopted. The crew's manipulation of the controls, it said, was the probable cause. Now, it was official. It was the crew's fault. We wanted to ask the NTSB and Boeing what evidence supported their conclusion. They refused an interview because of pending lawsuits. However, the safety but safety investigator Jim McIntyre, speaking for the Airline Pilots Association, thinks the report went beyond what the NTSB could prove. This conclusion is not based on any evidence. It was reached through a theoretical elimination of any possible mechanic failure. Uh, which we TWA Vice President for Public Affairs, Jerry Cosley, gives us the airline's uh, view. But we don't think uh, that, that Boeing's position in the thing uh, should automatically turn the cannon on the, on the cockpit. Uh, uh, they have testified under oath. There is no evidence that they did what the NTSB, in effect, accuses of doing. And I think both Boeing and TWA uh, uh, we'll continue to monitor the 727 fleet closely, as do other operators, to see if anything develops downstream that will shed some light on this. But they do more than monitor their aircraft. Even though the NTSB report cleared the plane of mechanical failure, TWA and the other airlines changed their maintenance procedures to inspect for actuator cracks more often. And the government's own agency, the FAA, recommended more frequent inspections of actuators for all carriers. 
And what about the actuator that was on the original plane? Most of it was never found, but a portion was sent to Boeing for testing. It's now missing, discarded or destroyed by Boeing after tests. And what about the pilots? Even before the official NTSB report blamed them for the dive, the story spread throughout the airline industry that they had been fooling around, experimenting in the cockpit. They feel it destroyed their reputations. They have become bitter at the thought that TWA and their union hadn't been stronger in their support. And in their isolation, they developed their own theories about why the blame has been pinned on them. I don't uh, know that I was framed, but I think that, uh, that the crew was used as a scapegoat. If you're conducting an investigation on your own aircraft and there's a chance of it being grounded, uh, uh, if you've got, you got a serious problem in this area, I think the best thing you can do is run way down the street and build a great big fire and get somebody's attention while you work on your problem over here. And the, the fire being uh, pointing here at the crew. 18 months after the NTSB issued its final report in this room, the Pilots' Union petitioned this board to reconsider its findings. The three pilots view this action as too little, too late. They have already put their case in the hands of the courts. They have filed a $20 million libel suit against Boeing, the FAA, and the NTSB to clear their names. I really tried to forget about it. I'm so glad that I'm alive that I feel very thankful to be here. Before filming our recreation of 841's dive, we gathered the passengers together. It was the first time they could talk to each other about how the accident affected them. I've, I've become a fanatic. I've read all kinds of things about airline safety. I, I get in a plane now and I do everything that you're supposed to do. I read the cards. I find out where the exits are. But you can't get in a plane. Only with Valium. Yeah. But I think it's hard when you're alone. I, like today, I was noticing people who were alone on the plane, and I'm thinking, God forbid, if something were to happen like this again, how, did, how do you cope when you're all yourself? Well, I saw a psychiatrist for about six months, and uh, he did a lot of good. Uh, he helped me through it. And I remember thinking something like I forgot to tell my wife that I loved her before I left. And only after this whole incident, I realized that I really didn't love her. So I got a divorce. Certainly it's made me kind of realize that uh, any day may be the last one, so you better, you know, live to the fullest. I stop and smell the roses along the way, much more so now than I did before. It's, it's a rare experience to have some insight into what those poor people who are killed in crashes go through. Well, sometime at night, if I can't sleep, I think of the sounds of the plane and the way it shook. We did appreciate the fact that we were saved. Um, I know they say it might have been the palace's fault, but uh, I still feel, no matter what happened, that he did bring us out of it. Oh, I'm yes, very grateful to him. They also met the pilots first time since the dive. Hi, what's your name? Mary from Terry. Hi, Mary. Nice to meet you. We're really glad to meet you. Yes, I think everyone is. Bob Gary Bates. Nice meeting you. Among the passengers, Holly Wicker has had to deal with the most serious consequences. Asha, the Indian infant Holly sheltered during the dive, is now a feisty four-year-old. She doesn't remember 841. But Holly can't forget. Her whole life is changed, and seeing Asha eases the pain. Sometimes when I'm really discouraged, really I need to go and see Asha. There, you know, there's got to be a reason for all this. It helps my depression a lot. She's gorgeous. She's a doll. My dad's liking a shot. <laughs> she deals with depression and physical pain. Holly dates her injuries from the moment she struggled against the pressure of a diving plane to bend over and give Asha a breath. It's all tissue damage. I rip muscles from my buttocks to my neck. Life at the Wicker household revolves around Holly's injuries. Everyone has had to adjust, especially her husband, Tim. A whole set of responsibilities shifted. We have most all of the house cleaning on schedule and the tasks allocated. Uh, every Saturday morning uh, in a couple hours, we do a real good job of getting the house spruced up. Get salad things out and get a salad made. Not only have the household duties shifted, Holly's injuries forced her to give up her full-time job. 
So the Wickers joined 11 other passengers in suing TWA and Boeing. Holly and Tim were awarded almost $400,000. But even with the settlement, the Wickers will still be measuring their loss. It's real painful for me to think about the things that she can't do anymore. Can you stop without falling down? And I had to come to grips with what, what worth is a person if they can't do anything. Where is my worth? I'd always judge my worth by what I did. For the pilots who flew 841 coming out of the dive was the easy part. The strains of all the months of investigation left them raw and dangling. It's affected me mentally to a great degree. Nightmares for well into two years. The nightmare has the captain turning around here with the magic face. Remember the show Magic? Mm -hmm. All right, with the magic face turning and then smiling and then the face flips over into Camshire. Over and over and over and over and every time the nightmare is just as real as the worst one you ever had as a child, only you're an adult. That oh, nightmare would yeah. eventually drive Gary Bang from the cockpit. Though he flew again almost immediately after the incident. The jokes and accusations from his fellow pilots, the rumors he had to fight throughout the industry, left him nervous and jittery. He requested to be put on medical leave. During the time off, TWA furloughed Gary along with other flight engineers in his seniority class. See, that's a different kind of plane. That's not like the one I used to fly. The hope of any medical help from TWA was now gone. It's been a very tough haul, and I have extreme bitterness for TWA. They furlough me out on medical, they furlough me out cold. Gary resigned from TWA and moved his family to Pittsburgh, where he started a new life, teaching business at a local college. Gary was hard on himself because he was so criticized. He's coming towards you. Oh, they're coming back. Come on over here, Nay. As other pilots judged him and judged so, the crew, they did not judge them favorably. Here, I think he felt again, people were coming back. at him, pointing a finger, saying, hey, you're guilty, you're, <laughs> you're everything but what you are, and that is a pilot who helped save an aircraft. I knew that he, in many ways, had really died on that aircraft. It wasn't um, death by flesh, of course, but he he did die and a new person was kind of emerged or born again if you will almighty god unto whom all hearts are open i think it has taken gary almost four years to really be happy with himself again i'm pulled out of a situation that constantly reminds me of trouble and i take on another job and i'm feeling excellent about me if you had a professor up here who was straight theory and not pulling in the practical side and i drive home every day feeling good about that day's work a bit of irony i i get a letter from the vice president of academic that says we have another letter of recommendation from a student keep up the good work and yet on the other side we save a whole damn plane of 89 people and i haven't heard thank you yet Scott Kennedy still flies as a co-pilot for TWA. Outwardly, he seems the least affected. Oh, look at that. That is just fantastic. Look at that. You didn't have a rifle. The Kennedy family had always dreamed of moving to Colorado. The town of Durango, nestled in the mountains, was a place that offered peace. After the 841 incident, they decided to make the move sooner. I and my wife and my family had determined that this area represented more what we wanted out of life. We could enjoy the outdoors, we could enjoy God's uh, beauty of nature. Las Vegas was Hoot's home for 14 years. His friends there saw him through a divorce, but supporting him throughout the investigation proved harder. Since this event's happened, it's been a little difficult living in my community. Uh, like when I used to go out and run, uh, you know, people wave at me now. People uh, go back in the houses when they used to wave or, you know, pretend like they don't see me. 
Well, in the last four years, I don't think I've gone much more than maybe five or ten minutes would be a real long time not to have it just flash through my mind. I left the United States because uh, it seemed like I couldn't escape this thing because I'm still in the industry. I thought possibly by, by uh, coming to Costa Rica where people didn't know what I did for a living that uh, I could kind of just blend in with the countryside. Here you go, here you go, there you go. And down here, I just feel the people, uh, they're friendly people and they like me just because I'm me. Nobody knows about TWA's Flight 841 and they could care less. Costa Rica was kind of an escape, I guess. Uh, I came down here hoping to, to get away from everything. It's a beautiful place and living is reasonable. I hadn't relied on anything other than aviation up until the last uh, four years, and and when this thing happened, it was only oh, took me about a year to decide that maybe I wasn't going to be able to, you know, to maintain and do this job under the pressure. While still flying for TWA, Hoot began to spend time in Costa Rica working on a jojoba bean farm he owns with friends. His instinct that he needed an occupation other than flying proved to be right. His career as a TWA pilot may have ended because he's developed serious health problems. He blames them on the battle to clear his name. I think it's had a greater effect on my health than a uh, negative effect than anything in my whole life. So I have a, an ulcer, a stomach problem right now. I'll be grounded for a mandatory six months. Maybe this little bit of time off uh, will give me the break that I need. Maybe I can go back and uh, maybe I can go back and handle things a little better. A lot of the people I think don't have any idea what they're in for when they're confronted with a situation like this. The last four years haven't been too great. I don't know what I can do to, uh, to make it be over for me. It's just that I can't get it out of my mind. For Hoot, Scott, and Gary, Flight 841 has never landed. For people who care about air safety, the NTSB investigation is far from conclusive. But the 727 that fell from the sky four years ago, it takes off and lands somewhere around the country almost every day. To recreate Flight 841 for this documentary, CBS paid the participants for their expenses and reimbursed the flight engineer for whatever income he lost during the filming. The filming itself took three days on a Hollywood set, using the same vibrating platform used for the movie Earthquake. The result was described by one critic as one of the most harrowing programs since the Twilight Zone went off air. The pilots profiled continue to live in their own Twilight Zone of bitterness and anger, but they have tried to move on. Gary Banks has moved to Washington State, where he's teaching. J. Scott Kennedy continues to work for TWA these days as a flight engineer. He still resides in Durango, Colorado. Pilot Harvey Hood Gibson retired from TWA in 1989. He told us that he hopes the case will one day be reheard and that the problem he believes caused the crash, a faulty rudder actuator, will be acknowledged and corrected. As for the lawsuits the men filed, the court eventually found that Boeing and the safety board showed no malice in their report on the incident. The lawsuits were dismissed. I'm Steve Croft, and those are the people who touched our lives from CBS Classics. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is. It's a water crime guy, CBS News.